Effective questioning. Right, hold on. Have you got any questions on effective questioning? Making sure something's gone in. Opening the door to misconceptions. I think that's one of the key things for being a good teacher. Let the students ask the questions. Effective questioning. Good question. Good question. Waiting a long time for an answer is really important, actually. You're supposed to give them lots of time. Testing understanding. Opinions are more important than right answers. Uh, giving pupil confidence. Letting them come up with the answers. Effective questioning. It happens in every lesson, doesn't it? Choosing the right words at the right time. Bloom's taxonomy. Keep things open. Keep it fun. An essential skill for a teacher. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. They are. Are all answers acceptable? Yes. I think you should encourage pupils to feel that their answers are, are acceptable. I would even go as far as to say all wrong or partly wrong answers are acceptable as well. As long as the student can support what they're saying. For some children that's a massive step in that direction just so they have the confidence to answer a question. Ultimately uh, you have to reach the right answer. That's the aim of the lesson, that's the, that's, that's the aim of teaching. And the only ones I'd say probably aren't acceptable. If they are trying to cause offence, certain answers need to be challenged. You might have the old student liking to make a joke about something. Hopefully I'm giving loads of wrong answers. <laughs> are deliberately designed to either be uh, abusive to somebody else. For example... Obviously you, you do get some very strange answers. Why do you think it is that this artist has done that, whatever? and at the time Ali G was quite popular with children. Certain things that you maybe don't want to hear. And he said, is it because I is black? Which obviously was not suitable. If, it, if a student does say something a bit risque, I'll try and turn it around. We laughed it off and I offered him a chance to discuss it at another point and then we moved on. I think all answers are acceptable. <laughs> I think it's all to do with encouragement. More questions, please. Ask, ask questions, quickly. There's nothing wrong with getting it wrong. Classroom culture is important because if you haven't got the right culture, you won't find students are prepared to answer questions. I think it's absolutely vitally important to... Get your classroom rules down for a start. And make sure that when someone asks or answers a question, that everyone has a silence and listening. I always make sure that nobody's answers are put down by anybody, including myself, but obviously by other children as well. It's down to the teacher. The rapport you have with the students. And finding different ways as well to ask the question, so not always putting the student on the spot. In my classroom... No matter what they say, they won't be laughed at, and if they are, that you'll deal with it. I like to have a, a classroom culture where students will say, yeah, but what if, you know, and, and we'll ask the questions themselves as well. So that they feel that they can say anything honestly, openly um, in that forum and they're not shy about that. It's certainly something I ha you have to consider as a teacher. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I don't know if I have an answer for that. The right question to the right child. It's really important to differentiate. Well, give me some ideas on this one. Mine's gone blank. Pitch your questions so it has that element of challenge, but also, you know, they feel safe enough to have a go and answer it. Very much so. With the low ability, it's I try and get an answer. And if you want to boost someone's confidence, then you will ask a question that they maybe, you know that they know the answer to. What is photosynthesis? You can use a mixture of closed and open questions. Whereas with the topper, more able students, almost a leading question, asking them more about their opinions. What you're getting at is being aware of the child's ability and where the child is in their learning so that you can pitch the question at the right level. That takes quite a long time to get to know every single individual in the class. It's knowing the students. And knowing the, the students who you know will, will be able to answer more extended questions. and Knowing what level they're at, knowing how far you can push them. What their limitations are. I'm thinking. I'm thinking, but I'm struggling. <laughs> if you've got a really, really um, pupil who lacks in confidence, asking them all the time the more difficult questions isn't going to do any, anything to encourage them. It's making sure that each question is specific to the child.
Yeah, always hands up. I don't have a no hands up policy. I do have hands up. A variety. I have this no hands rule. Starting off, you might have hands up. Um, no, I don't. I do, I do say hands up. Because otherwise they just all start shouting out at the same time and then you can't hear what's actually going on. Particularly for the younger students, I like it. Not really, I don't really like hands up too much. I start with hands up because I, it's nice to see that kids are keen to contribute. It gets them into a routine of actually listening to other people's answers as well. There's the keen being in the front, putting his hand up every time. I'll maybe start with him or her. Try to ask the student I'm most surprised that has their hand up. I'll definitely make sure that everyone says something every lesson. Very much so. But I don't always just has, ask the students who have their hands up. They expect that at any point in time I could ask them individually to answer a question. Quite easy to make a random name generator. I'll give out the flashboards. And I'm quite happy for, for students to shout out what's in their heads. To avoid having to ask for hands up. When you hold down F9, it cycles through the names very fast and it keeps on going through and through and they're, they're there watching for their name to come through and then you stop and it's on somebody's name. Pass the question, so I will choose the first pupil to answer and that pupil will then choose the next pupil. One I quite like is to just choose a, a number, ask a student to choose a number at random from 1 to 30 and pick that number from my register and ask the question to that student. But I do think it's important for those kids who want to contribute that they show that they want to and that you pick them sometimes. I think that's important. I, I always praise them for having a go. Stamping out misunderstandings. <laughs> Paraphrasing, rephrasing. Misunderstandings. <laughs> Stamping out disease. You can't deal with every single one. Tactfully. Misunderstandings. And do I really want to be correcting every single error? Um, I haven't got the time to do it. Sometimes I find I misunderstand my own questions. <laughs> if a child misunderstands something, it's usually a good idea to ask other children because if one misunderstands something, chances are the rest of the group might not have caught on to that. Well, I'm looking for them. I mean, I'm looking for them all the time. Trying to find as many different ways of saying the same thing. Getting them to explain it back to you. It might be just one word here or there, but that might be the key word that suddenly clicks with particular children. You have explained it to them so that you can clarify and check that the, the misunderstanding has been cleared up. Hmm, good question. And I say, oh, I see why you've got that. However, my question was, and then I reword the question. You can ask another student to re repeat the question. So it doesn't have to be me doing the, no, 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 that's wrong, but it, more of a case of, well, what do other people think about this answer? Um, I think is possibly more effective. If there's something they're embarrassed about, I'll try and just speak to them individually. Is it important that the wrong answers are challenged in some way? Then the answer is yes. But it is important, I think, to make sure that they all are aware that we all make mistakes, and if we can see where the mistakes are, there are going to be fewer in the future that we actually make. Sometimes I do. I plan all the starter questions. Plan them very carefully. Do you want me to answer in full sentences? Oh, is that how this works? I'll have questions in my head or in my lesson plan. Um, I don't actually sit and write down what I'm going to ask. For certain lessons, I need to write down a few questions that I want to ask the students. With the high ability classes, I'd, I like to plan the questions. Knowing what you, the purpose of your questions are. I plan most of the questions because I think... It seems something that's obvious, but actually it isn't. I don't anymore, but I did when I started. A newish teacher, early in their career, I think it's useful for them to think about the type of questions. In my lesson planning, for example, I always try to anticipate what I think the answer is going to be. It is a skill and it is a technique that has to be developed, I think, over the years. I'm hoping that maybe at the stage I'm at, it's a little more instinctive than maybe an NQT. I'm hoping. I don't quite know what you mean by unexpected answers. I love them. I think they're great. You have to have unexpected answers. I think you have to make a snap decision as to whether that is actually going to add to the learning. Yeah, I try and always put a positive slant on it. For instance, last year, we're looking at evolution and fossils. Unwanted answers you get quite a lot. What can we tell about a dinosaur with big feet? I like to stand there and just go, right. The students said they wear big socks. 
I never get angry because obviously I don't want to kill that ethos of having the nerve to put your hand up and having a go. Sometimes it puts them off if you actually take something they've given you and you turn it round into something they can learn from. There is such thing as a right and wrong answer. If it's something deliberately designed to disrupt uh, the lesson. How do you deal with them? Some need to be ignored. So you can actually say, well, yeah, it's a good idea, but no. Unexpected answers can really be the ones sometimes that can get a lesson to completely take off. And I think the trick with our craft is to ask questions that bring the kids back on into the lesson that you want to deliver. If I thought it was about misunderstanding, word the question in a different way and say, I don't think you fully understood. Let me, let's try again and re reword it and hope for a more positive response the next time. <laughs> How long would I wait for an answer? About that long. Generally until the class starts to get restless. You usually give them a good 30 seconds. You need to wait long enough to give them time to think. Waiting after asking a question is, is awful sometimes. Well, I could give you the textbook answer, you know, you always wait five seconds or 20 seconds for a question, you know, that's what most of the books will say. I don't think there's a time limit, really. I think I just... Um... This one, I just do the countdown with the hand and... I would wait for a while. Yes, it's, it's important for students maybe to reflect on a question. I don't leave it too long because the students often start then getting a bit anxious. If I've asked a question and within the first five seconds I've still got vacant looks at me, um, my question wasn't good enough. I don't know how long I do wait. You know, if nobody puts a hand up straight away, I reword the question and, you know, so I'm always talking, rewording the question in as many different ways as I can. I feel if a kid's sitting umming and eyeing for three, four minutes, then the class will lose interest. I don't know if that's productive to anyone. It's not productive for the student who's usually struggling if they haven't answered. If a student's really struggling but I really want them to answer, I'll try to lead them into it. Um, with the low ability I often do begins with a peak because I think they should have time to think and it's hard to give someone a question expecting to answer straight away. What can go wrong with questioning? Everything. Questioning can go wrong. Elaborate a little bit on it. Ineffective questioning could easily be closed questioning for a start, questions where they don't really have to think. Yeah, that can be one of the problems with questioning. Set a question that's just way too difficult for anyone to answer. The main thing that can go wrong with questioning, just don't get an answer. <laughs> None of them know the answer at all. That happens sometimes, it happened to me today. You can ask the wrong questions to the wrong students. If a student gets upset or intimidated. No student wants to have their lack of knowledge revealed in front of uh, other people. Questions where they can just guess easily, or yes or no is quite guess, there's a 50-50 chance I'll just say, well, no. Also, I think if you put people in an uncomfortable position. It's important not to put people on the spot with your questioning. You don't want the student to break down and, and, uh, and, and lose confidence. You get the very shy people and they're not going to want to answer. So again, it's about kind of helping them with their confidence, helping them to, to build up to a decent answer. And that if they don't get it right, you don't shout at them for it or you don't get angry with them. When you sit in front of the class, you've said your question and you're waiting and expecting a certain response and it doesn't come and then you're dead on your feet. But it's the prompts then that you go through. And the wording of the question is absolutely vital. Eventually there's a light bulb moment and they get it. Then that's really effective questioning.